give us a few seconds. If you're joining from uh, uh, somewhere else, if you're not on the Zoom events, if you're joining from LinkedIn or YouTube, please just enter a comment there. If you have any questions, mention them. We are running slightly behind today. So we'll start maybe with a minute gap. And if you have any questions in the meantime, please do put them in, in the chat. Uh, maybe just share where you're joining from. Give us another second. So we'll start shortly. I think we're having a little bit of difficulty. All right, it looks like Anand is here. I think hey, sorry. Are... sorry, I had to wrap it up the meeting. No, no worries at all. <laughs> all right, I think we'll begin now. Thank you everyone for joining. Today, we are going to have a conversation around how do you build your roadmap for Salesforce and artificial intelligence. This is the final session of Enterprise Dreaming. And uh, this has been an incredible experience for all of us. But this is the culmination of all of those conversations, right? You've heard about AI, you kind of have a sense of the potential of it, but how do you really bring it to your enterprise? Do you phase it? Do you do a big bang? What are all the considerations? So let's jump into it. My name is Saurabh Gupta. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Cloud Compliance and GPT-5. We are in Salesforce App Exchange ISV partner. So we are a product company and our products focus on data security, data privacy, and artificial intelligence. That's the background we come from. We do data retention, sandbox data masking, bring GPT type technology to your Salesforce. And we do all of that 100% natively on the platform. So with that out of the way, I am going to do a final gesture here for this concluding session to our sponsors. We are very grateful to work with some of these awesome uh, organizations that helped make this a reality. And uh, the good news is every session here has you know, brought in a ton of value to folks who attended it. We got some fantastic feedback and a lot of these uh, you know, sponsors are a reason for all of that success. Uh, after that, one last nod to all of these things that we talked about in Enterprise Dreaming. Really, there were two tracks. The idea of what's possible with AI and how do you embark on your journey and deliver on it. All of these sessions are recorded. So if you work with Sales Cloud, Service Cloud, Health Cloud, if you do document automation inside your Salesforce, if you work with financial services, all of those sessions are recorded and you will have the ability to go and access them. We will share resources. We've created a LinkedIn group where all the assets, all these videos are accessible from. Um, and if you are working in an organization where your CEO is saying, well, what are you going to do about AI? And you're working on a plan on it, then these sessions will uh, you know, bring a lot of that uh, uh, point of view to you. How do you make a business case? Is there ROI? How do you validate it? How do you address foundational questions around privacy, ethics, security? Finally, do you build it or do you buy it from a vendor? So this last session on build your roadmap is really kind of picking all, from all of these other sessions. So it's a sampler of sorts of all of these things. And that's what we'll be talking about. We are uh, on the App Exchange with GPT-5. This is the link in case you uh, are interested in taking a look. One last but really important thing from me before I hand it over to uh, Anand for introductions. This is not legal advice. This is not Salesforce's point of view. This is just our individual perspective. Everything in this document and these sessions from the speakers, everything that you're hearing is just for informational purposes. 
So, oops, I misspoke. One last slide. So what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about crawl, walk, run. What are the steps of building your Salesforce plus AI roadmap? And we'll particularly talk about uh, data because that is a significantly important aspect of trying to enable AI in your organization. Anand has some really good insights in, into it. And I'm so glad that he's going to be uh, you know, helping us understand the, the complexity around it. Then we'll talk about what does the crawl look like, right? How do you build that foundation? in terms of possibilities, business case, ROI, security, privacy, all of that. And then we will switch a little bit into technology, talk about some build versus buy architecture and all of that. And then how can you plan your go live? So that's really the agenda. With that, I will turn it over to Anand. Go ahead, Anand. Uh, hey, Saurabh, thanks. thanks, uh, And thanks for everyone who's listening and participating. I know it's uh, late evening for the East Coasters on a extended holiday weekend. So I appreciate you all taking the time. Uh, Anand Narasimhan, I um, CTO for SDOCs like Cloud Compliance and GPT-5. We are also a exclusive Salesforce app exchange partner. So prior to my uh, starting at SDOCs early this year in January, uh, I spent 15 years at Salesforce as one of their leading architects uh, was in professional services. And I have uh, had all kinds of challenges uh, thrown at me. I'm a certified technical architect, uh, certify the technical architects. Um, so I've done a lot of this, uh, understand Salesforce in and out, what it can do, what it cannot do, what it should not do, what it would not do. I keep going on and on. Uh, but uh, I, I like everyone else, and as Mark Benioff put it, uh, the AI tsunami is upon us. And I think enterprise, this enterprise dream in week, um, I would almost say is where enterprise and AI collide. Because I think there's a lot of conversations about AI in the broader landscape with you know open AI and BARD and all those. I have not seen a lot of conversations about B2B focused AI. Salesforce has the AI cloud, you know, Microsoft has a thing. Infrastructure level providers are talking about it. Google has borrowed. Uh, Open OpenAI is on Azure. OpenAI launched Enterprise uh, Edition like two days ago. Anthropic is talking about it. Like there is a lot of that going on. However, um, there has not been a very compelling B two B company that has emerged from a UI uh, AI perspective. Almost everyone's kind of nibbling at the very free of like generative AI. I believe there is more to AI than the generative. And generative is probably the buzz, but, you know, we'll talk more, but, you know, I'm looking forward to this active conversation. Um, take it away, sorry. And oh, this, is, this is my slide. So uh, for those who are not familiar with SDOCs, uh, we are essentially a, a document automation solution. Essentially three simple things, right? You can create sophisticated documents, bring any data that is on Salesforce or even off Salesforce, and then combine it with an eSign solution. All of this fully on platform, which means your data, your, your integra no integrations, easy to set up, scale, security, trusted, simple. And our goal and mission, if sorry, if you want to go to the next slide, is really to kind of remove the, actually you missed one slide if you go back. Sorry. Um, no worries. Um, our goal is just to remove a lot of like the cognitive burden that the end user has with sales reps having to think about which template, where is this, all that, and simplify and make work really flow better with the use of SDOCs. So with that, we are a, a sponsor at Dreamforce. Uh, 1325 is our booth, and we'll have a large presence. Um, do, do visit us, do share it with your customers and prospects. Stop by and say hi. We'd love to put a uh, face to the name always. And, you know, we've got a couple of sessions. I'll be talking, uh, my solution engine will be talking and a few events that we're sponsoring with other um, other vendors as well. Right. So thank you so much, Anand. So let's dive right into it. Let's talk about crawl, walk, run. What are the steps of your AI roadmap? And what you'll find is, you know, a lot of this is not uncommon or different from what you would do with any disruptive technology. There are some areas where there is a greater emphasis. So really what you want to do is one of the first things to look at is your data, understanding it and identifying what is usable today. 
And Anand is going to talk quite a bit about it. And he brings a lot of very interesting perspective that I think are useful for all of us to, to appreciate and acknowledge as we embark on this. And then we'll dive into what makes good AI use cases. You know, that can be a quick win for your organization. How can you utilize that in prioritizing it? How do you build a good case for return on investment? And literally a lot of these things that we are talking about here are a separate session in itself. So any of these areas that interest you, you can always you know, revisit the recorded sessions on that. We have a one for business case in ROI that I did with Ian. And then from there, we'll jump into a security compliance and some other areas that can be potential showstoppers for a technology like this. Again, there is a session on security that Vernon and Doug Merritt did. There is one on uh, ethics and compliance that Puneet and uh, Tom Kemp did. So lots of very good detailed information in all of these areas. Then we'll talk about how do you think about this in terms of pilots or POCs and how can you assess AI technologies? And finally, how do you go live with them and implement it? In the assessment of AI technologies, we'll also talk a little bit about build versus buy, which is another session that Anand and uh, um, you know, Vernon uh, were part of. Um, so lots of different things that you would get a sense of. Um, so let's go further. Let's talk a little bit about the whole crawl walk run and what do we mean in context of Salesforce and AI? So when you think about Salesforce and AI, the first and foremost area is to identify key use cases in your sales and service org, right? Like you may be able to do a lot of other things eventually, but the most impact that you can make with AI is in sales and service. And obviously this is the foundational phase. So this is where you also want to address the security, privacy, ethics, compliance type concerns that may be existing in your organization, because these are very, very legitimate challenges. You know, a lot of companies are worried about this, very rightfully so. And as technologists or as people who are driving this forward, we owe it to our stakeholders, our partners, and everybody else that, you know, we are thinking about it very, very uh, seriously and addressing them, right? Like this is the surest way to kill a new technology is to, you know, kind of stub your toe on it, right? You stumble into something and you just hastily deploy it. And then there is this massive embarrassment that happens. Nobody wants this. And it really poisons the, the value that some of these technologies can bring to the table. So with that in mind, here is a little bit more of the detail on the crawl, right? You want to focus on sales and service use cases predominantly on where can you bring more automation, where can you bring more efficiency, right? And address the ethics, security, all of those uh, concerns. So really all of your requirements are around delivering on low hanging business use cases. And we talk about it in a little bit here. And you also want to address all of these other areas. Again, we talk a little bit about security, privacy, compliance. There are whole sessions that you can look at. There's a lot of PDF, a lot of other resources. And then from there, you can eventually get into walking. And the idea of walking is now that you've addressed some of these, you know, basic, you know, low-hanging business use cases, showed value within the organization. There is a element of change management that has happened. There is some adoption in certain uh, departments and silos and teams that have happened. Now you want to spread it broader, right? You may go to other areas. You may have finance and operation and other areas where you can leverage this. You may also push the envelope on what the technology itself can do. Maybe you want to fine tune and train your AI, right? You can address a lot of other questions around it. What you will also find is now, if this is in the second phase, you also start looking at process re-engineering. Up here, you may be going, I click a button and I generate an email draft. I click a button or automatically summarize cases, right? And there's a case summarization available for someone. Things like that. Those are low-hanging fruits. You can do them today. But as you get into walk, you're also looking at what do we do today that does not need to happen now that we have AI, right? Are there inefficiencies in the process, manual workarounds? Are there ways to re-engineer things better and drive this forward? So that's what you're doing in walk. And run is where you really internalize it in the organization. It may then you know, influence your product roadmaps. It may add more juice to your offerings, you know, your entire customer experiences. You may build new service level agreements. You may build new kind of service and support uh, agreements because you can now deploy AI to a level where it has reached the periphery of the organization and it's now starting to influence uh, a, a much larger 
um, you know, uh, impact on your revenue, on your customer experience, on your partner experience, things like that. So that is really sort of a very, you know, simple way of th thinking of crawl, walk, run. For most organizations, I think the crawl itself, depending on how quickly your organization does this, uh, you know, what I'm seeing is, uh, you know, companies are looking at this from like a three month horizon to like a 12, 15, 18 month horizon. And I suspect some of the early movers will then get into walk maybe in six, nine, 12 months. I, I think a lot of tech companies would tend to be very comfortable with technology will go there. Some industries that are traditionally more conservative, highly regulated ones, health, you know, financial services, things like that, they may they may uh, walk more gingerly on some of these. And which also reminds me, we do have recorded sessions for health cloud and financial services cloud that you can also refer to. Anand, any comment you want to make on this before we move on? No, I, I, I mean, this framework is good. Um, I think I'll talk a little bit about like, um, before you crawl, uh, you need to actually lay off, I mean, lay the platform or like the, the setup of where you're going to crawl and you cannot crawl on a, a path that's full of thorns because you're going to get hurt in the crawl and never walk and run. So I'll talk a little bit about the thorns and the, and the rocks <laughs> very soon. All right, let's do that. So I think that's the next session. <laughs> Go ahead. Right. Take it away. Great segue, right? So, I mean, you know, there have been many, many things about said about data. And I think the, the thing that probably resonates the most is data is like, and I think in the technology industry, <clears throat> I, I've read this, I don't know who came up with this, but data is the new oil, right? And the, the, a large set of enterprises that I deal with are extremely protective of their data, right? Like I dealt with a large insurance provider uh, while I was at, still at Salesforce and they refused to share like much of their data with Salesforce. Like Saurabh and I have implemented many Salesforce implementations. It's a constant battle. Saurabh was part of a large insurance provider himself uh, at Salesforce when we implemented it. And like the data architecture discussion was so long and they were like, nope, we're not gonna share this data, right? And part of this is data is becoming a company's IP. Uh, there are companies that are essentially pivoting to becoming data as a product companies, which uh, is important. And, and there are the five V's of data. Some of you might've heard this. But I want to talk about this because this is important to uh, the AI world that we're uh, in right now. Number one is volume, just sheer amount of data that's going to come real time, non real time, batch. How late is it? Is it aggregated? Is it granular? All of that, right? And when we talk about real time, the velocity of data, a B2B company's velocity of data will be a lot lower than a B2C company, right? A FedEx is going to get a heck of a lot more velocity than a, uh, you know, a small, or medium business. Uh, your deal velocity is going to, like the number of deals that come through the pipe are going to be different. The number of customer engagements are going to be different, right? So B2C, B2B is different. B2B to C is different. Uh, the variety of data, this is where enterprises struggle, right? Uh, and, and I'll share some statistics on this in, in a few slides, but there are different sources of data, customer generated, systems generated, uh, unstructured data, structured data, you know, that IoT data, you know, there's all kind of that, right? Veracity is probably the most important we in all this. Veracity here means the quality, right? What is the standard of this data, right? Like how reliable is this data? Uh, so garbage in, garbage out is usually what ends up happening. Bad data, bad outputs. And then the last thing is what is the value that this data is generating for you? And what is the value of that data itself? Uh, you know, examples like social media interactions about something are valuable to some companies, but not valuable to others. Like if, if you're a B2B company, having someone talk about the US Open um, where Andy Murray was there, I, I just happened to be in, uh, at the US Open on Tuesday. So just giving you that example. But Andy Murray playing in US Open and people tweeting and doing something about it has no value to you being a B2B company. But if you're a... Uh, you know, marketing company or like an apparel company or like any of that, 
you're definitely going to pay attention to that versus something else, right? So value is super important. So with that, let's talk about data quality, right? Which is the veracity side of this. And some statistics here, right? Um, even though we think enterprises have these databases and SaaS platforms, first and foremost, it is a fire hose, right? A lot of data that's coming on. And 80 to 90% of that data is unstructured, right? You think about an average enterprise, even if you think about sales or service or marketing, like if you go talk to your own sales and marketing teams, where are they all day, every day? They're either in email or on phone calls or on Slack or Teams or WebEx Teams or whatever IM tool that they use, or they're on Chatter or some kind of like enterprise social media feed type platform all unstructured data. This is a large part of what enterprises generate. Second is the sheer amount of data that's being generated, like 1.7 megabytes every second being generated in an enterprise. Huge, right? Like think about that, what that means for a day and a week and a month and a year, right? This is like terabytes of data, sometimes petabytes of data. And then the last thing at the end of the day, whether you're a B2B company or a B2C company, ultimately there is a consumer that's being touched there is an individual that's being touched. That individual is a consumer and their attention span is pretty darn small, 8.25 seconds. So you have very little time to capture their attention. You have very little time to grab the data that you need that is going to help you drive them through a journey and ultimately make you a loyal customer or convert a prospect to a customer. So the velocity is insane, right? Uh, in terms of what it is. And then let's talk about the quality, right? I, I talked about veracity and veracity is data quality, right? If you've been in the enterprise, especially in, I, I've spent a lot of time in large enterprises and, you know, to some extent, even Salesforce, so all of them struggle with the quality of data. If if they search and I've uh, I've searched for, customers' names while I was working at Salesforce, there would be six instances of those. And then there used to be a thing like, oh, MDM will solve it, right? In my 15 years at Salesforce, having dealt with large enterprises, there's not been a single enterprise that has actually said, we love our MDM. Everyone's like, we hate our MDM. I have 15 instances of, or 150 instances of GE Healthcare. I don't know which one to trust. Where do I put my opportunity? Oh, account hierarchy will solve that. No, no, one, no one's figured this out, right? From a data engineering perspective, this is what data engineering teams and data management teams spend three hours a day. Like imagine that, right? If you're a data engineering and if you're an enterprise, that team is usually, you know, 30, 40, 50 people. That's a lot of money spent on data quality. Second, the, the, the variety of data, 400 systems on an average in an enterprise, 400 systems, Salesforce, like Salesforce would be one, and I would almost consider Salesforce many systems because of the number of clouds that they have. 400 systems, just imagine the amount of like redundant data that's sitting across all this and putting this all together. And then lastly, Gartner made, made a great uh, study on this, 13 million a year on an average lost due to data quality, right? That's a, a significant amount of money. And if you just multiply that with the number of enterprises, that's a staggering amount of money that's sitting there because of data quality. And the irony of all this, this has been an issue for at least a couple of decades. MDM has tried to solve it. AIs are trying to solve it. Snowflake is trying to solve it. Databricks is trying to solve it. The reality is it has never been solved well. I am still waiting for one company that can actually somehow magically figure this out. And the problem is it is not as magical because there is no easy way. You can't, it's, there is no predictable way. But anyway, let's, let's talk about the outcomes as a result of this velocity and, you know, uh, veracity and velocity is, I mean, I'm going to use the cliched phrase of lipstick on a pig. That data, that outcomes, garbage in, garbage out. So this, this is what every enterprise is grappling with, right? You will get some random emails recommending something to you that you had like no idea why. Yes, sometimes they get it right, somewhat yearly right. <laughs> Uh, but this is the largest issue. Like back to the crawl, walk, run. data is the thorn that you're probably going to run on. So you have to clear those thorns out or data quality and veracity and variety are the thorns you're going to crawl on. 
if you crawl on those without a lot of preparation, you're going to get hurt really bad and you're never going to walk. You're going to be so afraid of crawling. Natural human instinct, you're never going to walk, right? So if you go to the next slide, uh, Saurabh. So go ahead, take, 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 it on, take it on. Yeah, I think so. Thanks, Anand. This is, you know, really a prominent area to be concerned about, right? Like, uh, you know, the good news is this, this is for a lot of organizations, this is not news, right? We know that this is a problem and organizations are going to do these. So what we are doing here is when you're thinking about building your AI foundation in your crawl phase, if you will, on that roadmap, bear in mind what data is usable. You want to identify areas where you can leverage on information. So even if it is, you know, you've got an opportunity and you're looking at related records, you've got an account, you're looking at related records. So that sliver of information where you believe you're still on a solid ground, that is a great way to, you know, to identify the scope of what you want to build on. So let's jump a little bit into the possibilities here, right? Organizations in the world today, every organization, regardless of the industry you are in, regardless of whether it's sales cloud, service cloud, whatever function you are addressing, this is the reality, right? Every organization has been asked to improve revenues, increase new logos, grow existing business, improve forecast accuracy, enhance sales efficiency. I don't really find an exception to this unless maybe you work for government or you're in the public sector where there are more altruistic motives, right? For most for-profit organizations, this is the direction they are going in. And even if you're non-profit, you still want to maximize the impact of all the money that has been you know, poured into your organization. So when you think about it, fundamentally, we are all asked to do more with less, right? And what the trend is, specifically if I take up sales, is that we are trying to move away from transactional interactions to personalized interactions, from unstructured data and, you know, to actionable insights, from the grunt work of sorting data, again data, <laughs> to automating some of these areas and helping reduce that manual overhead, error rates, things like that. And we want to move away from broken reporting, kind of jumping from system to system to system, you know, kind of cherry picking data from a bunch of places to getting a clearer deal visibility. And when you think about the economic uh, challenges in this last slide, and the sort of transition that we are asked to make, that is where AI can help accelerate you know, this, this transformation. It can catalyze it. Is it a panacea? No, it's not gonna be like you flip a switch and everything becomes awesome tomorrow. But you know, there is a slow crawl here. There is There are challenges on data, you know, uh, security, privacy, ethics, all of those things. But within those constraints, this is what we are all trying to do. Some version of this is pretty much all of us in the room here, right? Um, so can, I, can I make a comment sure. on this? Um, like, I think this is perfect, right? Like challenges to where you are today to where you want to be. Uh, it's almost like your GPS. Um, and like data is almost like your compass uh, or like the parts of your compass. And if if you have a magnet in your compass, you're going to head in the wrong direction, <laughs> right? So this jump is what we are seeing. But again, I go back to data is almost the bedrock for all this. If your data is not great, and if your data governance and your quality and your, your, your management of your data is not great, you can say I can fix reporting in bit to better deal visibility, but that deal visibility might actually point you in the wrong deals only to realize that you're not hitting your bottom line or your top line. So again, all of this is actually still grounded on the fact that you need to get your data right, which by the way, is not a new problem. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So let's talk a little bit about what is really AI helping us do or can potentially do. These are some examples of it, right? If you think of Salesforce, there is a, a fair bit of stuff that we all do you know, part of it is manual, part of it is our folks are, they've figured out some work around. So there is an element of grunt work. If I'm a case rep, I am creating a, a note summary or a case summary after a call. If I am a, a, a sales rep, I'm creating an opportunity summary for my pipeline review. So there are all of these things that I'm doing today. And what AI can do is it can make those things a little less manually intensive. It's not going to completely eliminate a lot of them, 
But if I have to write a follow-up email to a prospect, AI can read all the past content, all the prior interactions, and generate a draft that is more personalized, that is contextually intelligent. And those are the kind of cases where AI brings a very interesting spin to these things. It reduces the amount of time we are manually spending on all this grunt work. And our job as, as folks who are trying to drive this change is to really identify those use cases where there is enough financial viability, where there is enough technology feasibility, and where you know all of these other foundational areas don't become a significant showstopper. The other thing where this extends is not only can you generate out some of this content, but you can automate by integrating it with things like document management, kind of stuff that SDocs does, right? The intention is that if you are uh, pulling all of this information, if you're enriching it with AI, if you're summarizing it, if you're pulling additional data from the web, from other sources, and coming up with, say, an account 360, you can generate a document management uh, type of solution that will uh, create a really good report. I'll give you an example from the webinar we had today with Kameen on financial services. And we were talking about in financial services, this, there is this idea of a tear sheet. So if you go and meet a financial planner or a banker, they may have a little report on your assets, your liabilities, your aspirations, your 529s, your retirement goals, all of that. And they may pull that paper version and they may just go over it with you. You can also do it uh, you know, in a PDF or something. And a lot of people do it electronically, but a lot of people still prefer a paper version. With all of this stuff that's getting automated, you can generate out a really great PDF using tools like SDocs and others, and you can print it out and have that conversation. Today, some version of this happens with a much higher degree of manual uh, labor, you know, with a, with a lot of grunt work, and AI can help reduce us that. So that's the power of some of these things. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit, Anand, about the document grunt work here? Yeah, so so this again uh, came out of a study with uh, Forrester and uh, leading eSign vendor, which is DocuSign. Um, and you know, I won't read into a lot of the numbers, but you know, in the world of enterprise, ultimately everything results in in a document, whether that's a contract, an MSA, an NDA, you know, an invoice, a bill, an SOW. You know, there's so many different <laughs> documents, and you know, a couple of numbers I'll highlight. Right, the first number is the sixty percent that you see in the top left which is the amount of rework due to manual entry, right? You know, this is where SDOC shines, like there is no manual work in copy pasting. Uh, from an end-to-end -end process perspective, like on the agreements or any kind of approvals and workflows, 58% lack of visibility, right? Think about a salesperson that's trying to get a deal through in the end of the quarter, and they have no idea where in the operations process is it. Is it with legal? Is it with finance? Is it with procurement? No one has an idea, right? So lack of visibility. Again, as a sales rep, you're antsy about getting your deal done so that you can get a commission check and you're not sure. So that's, again, a lot of times spent on this. And, you know, like just like some of these numbers, if you just do the math around the, the slowdown in deal velocity or the amount of sheer manual process that goes on, it's just mind boggling on how much of money is wasted on just some of these inefficient manual yet uh, you know, required processes. Absolutely. All right. And then I'll take this one, um, Sarb. So, I mean, at, at, at stocks, we've been kind of thinking about AI. And as I said, I've, I've been somewhat sitting on the sidelines of AI just for that initial euphoria to kind of die down. And I think we're kind of at that, that trough of disillusionment, uh, as Forrester puts it, or I think it's the Forrester or, or Gartner uh, that puts it. But we're finally at a point where we are actually evaluating what can we do, right? So number one is, uh, as I see it, AI in the enterprise and specifically as it pertains to documents, I've spoken to a lot of lawyers of late who work in commercial contracts. And their biggest issue is that these teams are small and they get a lot of throughput through their, um, through their uh, groups and they don't have the time. And a lot of times it's small things that require their assistance. A salesperson's not a lawyer, but you could what you could use the AI's analytical capability to kind of push up some of this upfront, right? When you look at a contract and you know certain things are not acceptable, 
why have a lawyer having to review 30 pages to tell you that if you can have AI do that for you and you can train your model to do that, right? So this is something that is becoming more and more obvious. Uh, the legal ops space is heating up with this notion of self-service legal ops. Second is generation, which I think we've talked about enough, right? And then adding to self-service is this compliance checking, right? Uh, Saurabh and Kavin talked about the tear sheet or like standard documents and all that. Some of this is based on structured data that's built into financial services cloud and all that. But some of this is unstructured in documentation. Like, do you have this and blah, blah, blah. And sometimes the customers or your loan applicants themselves are not sure what else do I need to give, right? And then, you know, if you're closing a house, there is this one document that's missing or one checkbox that you forgot, right? Like there's a lot of AI and automation that you can do there. And, you know, all of this needs to be done with a sense of privacy and trust. Like this is where the AI revolution as it stands today has really not gotten its act together. Yes, Salesforce has said this Einstein GPT trust layer. Great buzzwords, but we need to kind of open up under the under the covers and really understand what that means. I'm hoping Salesforce gets to that level of details in a week and a half at Dreamforce. Same thing, like uh, I'm on another Slack uh, channel with a lot of like like-minded LLM uh, folks. And this notion of privacy and trust comes up again and again. And then the last thing I will say, back to connecting it back to data, enterprises love their data. They don't want to give, away, give up their data because data breaches, data leaks, all of that happen. How do you employ large language models and AI in a data virtualized manner such that you and the, or the customer is in control of what and how that data is being used, right? So for those who have been in this space, Samsung's employees use ChatGPT uh, because it was kind of cool and they started to use it. Little did they know that their employees were actually asking questions about their own proprietary IP. And long and behold, a few months later, ChatGPT was answering in the public domain with answers that were actually considered intellectual property of Samsung. Imagine that could happen to any enterprise. You could lose your entire market share because of that. And this is why as SDOCs, we are actually taking our time to understand what privacy and trust mean before we actually do anything with that. So we're, we're kind of like toying some ideas. If you're interested, please connect me on LinkedIn or through the group. I would love to talk to you about it. Awesome. That is a really great call out, Anand. Thank you so much. All right, let's get back into this other portion of this. Okay, great. So I can do all these magical things on the documents, on killing grunt work, and I can auto-generate so many wonderful things. But how do you start, right? You're building a roadmap. What are good use cases? So what you want to do is two things. You want to identify business scenarios which are high value. If I can save 30 minutes of my sales rep in a day, what is that math? If I can do that for my support rep, what is that math? Is there enough value in able to do that? And I want to do it for things that have low nuance. The point here is, can you use a generative technology? Think of like chat GPT style technology, whether it comes from OpenAI or Google or Amazon or you know Microsoft Azure or from Salesforce, right? Regardless of who your vendor of choices for that AI model, you don't want to start with something that requires six months of training by really expensive folks, right? You want to start with something where I'm like, I can just immediately start using it in my enterprise context. So you want low nuance in terms of technical complexity and high value in terms of business. Fairly commonsensical way to say, but is it easier said than done? Let's take a look at this. So there is a bunch of use cases that we've put together. Uh, one of my colleagues would share here, or if you join the LinkedIn group that you know we've created, you can get access to it. So we've created a bunch of use cases that you can, it's just a PDF, you can get it. You don't even have to give an email address or something. So you can see specifically sales cloud, service cloud, health cloud, financial services, all of them. And you can see what the possibilities are and pick the ones that interest you. But let's say you have picked something and you still need to do a return on investment calculation, right? So here is an example for service cloud that we took. Let's assume you have a hundred sales rep and you can, you know, allocate some cost, maybe it's offshore or something, and it's $30 an hour, and they're handling about 40 calls a day. 
And on, on a lot of those calls, they are sitting and someone says, hey, I opened a case and I sent an email or I went to your community site and put some information. What's the status? What's happening? And as a rep, I'm like going, okay, hold on a sec. Let me read this a bit. Let me get up to speed. And if they're spending an average of three minutes on reading a case detail, you can do this math. And that would be a staggering 6K a day, right? This is for an organization that's got a 100 people call center. The good news is you don't have to agree with any of this number. I have a link somewhere in this uh, where you can actually get a Google Sheet version of this. You can make a copy of it, plug in your own numbers, arrive at your own conclusions. But this is a very, very simple back of the envelope calculation of how much money are you spending today, which is not hard cash, right? You're not paying $6,000 a day for a product license. So it doesn't show up in your CapEx, OpEx. It's this sunk cost somewhere because you have this many reps and productivity based. And this is a really interesting way to identify these things. The other part of this is it is a double whammy, right? If I'm your customer, I'm waiting on the phone for three minutes while you know your rep may be make, talking about weather or who played who in the in the game and I'll, and they're looking at this. But that's something you want to eliminate, right? Everybody's losing in this. And it's this kind of grunt work that you know we want to identify. We may have to unlearn how we do things today to identify something as simple as this. The second portion of this is great. Now that you know this, how can you do an ROI analysis? So we took GPT-5, our product, that is like $10 per user per month from App Exchange, but you can apply any product, right? For 100 reps with this and with some open AI costs, in this case hosted on Microsoft Azure, we did some numbers, you know, so we think it's 40K a year, and you know you can save nine hundred thousand. But you know what? Vendors come up with any number. Don't trust me. <laughs> Let's assume that this is ten times this number, right? It is four hundred thousand dollar and not forty k, and you still save half a million dollar. That's the kind of ROI analysis you want to do. And like I said, there is a Google Doc, a link of which my colleagues would share. You can go run your numbers. You know, knock yourselves out on that, and pick up any of those use cases that we were looking at and keep running those numbers for it. But the point is, there is enough value here for us to validate, like, is there a viable you know, a business case? Is there a viable return on investment in AI? And a lot of the things that we are talking about, a lot of things that are on those use cases are here and now. These are not figments of imagination. These are not roadmap items. You know, you could probably get a lot of those with AI Cloud. You can definitely get those with GPT-5. You can build your own. But the point is, regardless of the direction you go in, I would urge you to really start thinking about this in your roadmap. It will take you a long way in terms of making an impact in your organization if you're a consultant for your customers and do it with a sense of reality. Anand, any comment on any of this before I move on? So, so I think in your previous slide, you talked about the call center. I think there's a, a really good stat on the cost per second for a uh, person on the phone. Uh, I don't remember uh, the exact number, but it is not cents. It's usually dollars. Uh, and just just being able to summarize and make some quick assessments on the case history could be a savings of 40 seconds. And in a B2C call center, 40 seconds saved could be millions of dollars. Uh, IBM actually might have a, a public case study with Salesforce on how they saved 45 seconds per agent through Salesforce without AI, which resulted in huge benefits. Uh, so, I mean, I would just probably Google it. I'm sure there's a, they presented at Dreamforce maybe five, six years ago, and that might've changed recently, but irrespective, I just go Google for cost per call or cost per minute for a average B2C call center. And you, you can do the math. I think you're being conservative here. Absolutely. And yeah, and that's kind of what my thought is. I mean, Anand and I have spent so much time on the on the receiving end of these things when vendor pitch it, right? We have been in the implementation business for so long. Like, I don't trust, you know, vendors and numbers like these. So frankly, I don't even trust my own numbers. And I would requ request you to not trust anything I'm showing here. It's just a sample. You should 10x it. Right. If we think it's 40K, you 10X it, right? You do your own math. Okay. But the point is, there is enough juice here for organizations to move forward and really seriously consider it. Because if you don't, 
rest assured your competitors will. I mean, it can be a competitive disadvantage as you know the evolution of AI continues to move forward. With that out of the way, let's talk about the other horny issue that comes up with AI, security, privacy, ethics, and compliance. And like I mentioned earlier, for the document management portion, for the ROI and business use case, and for security, privacy, ethics, and compliance, there are entire one hour recorded video for each of them. And they are presented by experts who've spent a lot of time. Most of the people that are in enterprise dreaming are all practitioners. This is not a theoretical endeavor because we don't come from a theoretical world. People like Anand and me have, like we have been grounded <laughs> in this, let's go make stuff happen uh, philosophy, thanks to Salesforce and uh, customer success there. So these are things that are real here. So let's talk about security, privacy, ethics, and compliance for a minute. There are regional privacy laws like GDPR, CPRA, PDPB, and there is a lot more that's happening in it around AI. There are ethical considerations of what AI can potentially do. How do I control and prevent it from you know, introducing biasness or to toxicity or hallucinating? How do I address data residency requirements? I'm a global organization. Maybe I want to deploy AI in the uh, United States, but not in Europe. How do I address data security and access? So all of them are covered extremely well. I would highly recommend that you go take a look at some of those. And if you need, reach out to me or Anand in that LinkedIn group that we'll share shortly. And uh, any of these areas, happy to have a chat. So let's talk about security for a minute and compliance, and then we'll get into some of these other areas. So you really are looking at these components when people talk about security. You're looking at Salesforce security in terms of what data inside Salesforce is you want to access through AI, uh, and then what do you send it to security? Oops. All right. And uh, how do I ensure security in transit? So all of these things, Salesforce security, security in transit, AI security, these are three broad areas. For example, if you look at Salesforce's trust layer or our security layer, we are a native app exchange product. So both of those things, Salesforce security layer or Salesforce trust layer or GPT-5 security layer, they are trying to retain all the confidential and sensitive data inside Salesforce. So we mask it before it goes out to some AI. If you pick a bring your own model, which is kind of how we operate, so you can bring your own open AI on your Azure or your AWS or your GCP and whatever you like, you want to lock the heck out of this thing here. You want your people to have this dedicated instance access, lock it down, make sure there is no cross-contamination, there is no you know, way for this information to leak out. And obviously a lot of these technologies here, and of course Salesforce here, support security in transit. You can have TLS, mutual TLS, a lot of very sophisticated things. Again, there's a whole one hour talk on it, but as you embark, as you continue to go down on this building your roadmap, you definitely want this section on security and compliance. In terms of compliance also, there is a whole level of security you can apply here. And there are, you know, you can connect to multiple AIs. So if you want to address data residency and things like that, you can connect to multiple AIs hosted in different regions. So that's a very simple example of that. But fundamentally, when people talk about all of this, there are these six perspectives, right? In the privacy and ethics, it's not just the legal requirements. It's not just the privacy law requirements. There is a human aspect to it. There is an ethical aspect to it. There is a conversation around money and there's a conversation about the social impact of it. I'm not going to dive into this too much, but know that there is a privacy and ethics uh, webinar that's already recorded that you can access that talks in length about this. And it's an excellent, excellent uh, use of an R in my opinion. So <laughs> that was, I kind of covered a bunch of these things at a very high level, predominantly because the idea is it's a sampler for your roadmap. And then you can look at those details. Let's talk a little bit on the technology side of this. Let's talk build versus buy architecture and some of those things. So here is an option of how you can think about your enterprise apps and generative AI. You have choices of how you're going to enable AI in your, you know, in your organization, and that should be part of your roadmap. Obviously, you could do it through Salesforce, which is a platform we all like and love. Great way to do it. It's already there, right? It's a very important aspect of your digital transformation. So your internal users, your partners, your end customers, if you ever decide to enable AI for some of those groups, Salesforce is a natural way to do it. But you may have other options, right? You may want to 
wire it into your other apps. Uh, you may have dynamic subspot, SAP service now, whatever. Or you may have a homegrown. You may go, well, we have a homegrown portal and we are just going to enable AI in it. Great. So you have some options there. In our case, since we are talking Salesforce and AI, we will just continue to go down this. If you take Salesforce as your vehicle of, of uh, distributing AI capabilities, right? You have choices. You could do it with Salesforce AI Cloud. You could do it with GPT-5, which is available on App Exchange. You could do it with AI Gateway, which is an open source thing that Vern and Keenan has put together on GitHub. You can try that out. You can build your own, right? You have those options. So as your roadmap gets to this point, you need to do a build versus buy and you can look at this. Now, a lot of these Salesforce AI Cloud offers a set of uh, AI engines that you can use. But with, I think, these other two or three, you can choose what AI model and what hosting provider you want to use. The good news is uh, there is a lot of options and most large medium-sized enterprises have a strategic partner. So if you work with Microsoft Azure, you can get OpenAI on Microsoft Azure. If you are an AWS shop, there is Bedrock, Google has Vertex, and there are these other specific providers such as Cloud and Cohere that you can go with. The idea of all of this is as you build your roadmap, you want to have this section where you may want to do some due diligence and, and figure out which of these is attractive to you. If you decide to go with something like what we offer, we, you know, we do free trials, happy to set you up with one. You can try it out, do a little proof of concept, proof of technology, and make sure that, you know, those use cases that you are looking at, they're valid. A lot of our pilot customers do proof of concept with masked data or fake data. And that's a great way to do it because then you're not risking anything. Uh, you can bring your AI here, you know, just enter your uh, API keys in secret and uh, GPT-5 will start connecting to it and basically start addressing it. So that's a really, really simple way of doing this. Um, and some of the other areas to think about when you build your roadmap is prompt engineering, usability and adoption. Security, we already talked about it. And how do you enable AI across the enterprise? Uh, some of these models, including ours, enable you to connect to more than one AI. So you may have re data residency requirements for which you may want to do this. You may have other reasons. You just want to use a verticalized AI such as a Bloomberg GPT because you're financial services, but you also want to use something like OpenAI on Azure, right? So you can have multi multiples of those. These are some other areas to think about it from a, a build versus buy and you know proof of a, a concept type perspective. Again, there's a session for that with Vernon and I think Preetam that you can uh, take a look at. So this really brings me to resources. I should take a pause here and see. Anand, do you have any comment on anything? I know I went a little fast. No, no, I, I think you covered it, right? I think uh, experiment, I, I, I almost like the, the crawl, walk, run. Crawl is almost the experiment, right? And, you know, prompt engineering. The one thing that we probably didn't talk about, which I'm starting to see a growing trend, um, you, you might have uh, Bloomberg in here. I am seeing the rise of what I'll call ILMs, which are industry language models, uh, mm -hmm. where they are purpose-built and trained for a specific industry and therefore have better awareness. Uh, I believe, and, and maybe you might have covered this, uh, Saurabh, but... Uh, I felt like that is a critical need that is coming up. And, and I'm seeing that trend a lot, right? Is that um, is that ILM concept? Um, and and then the... Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Now, I was just going to bring this one slide, which I think uh, is, is in direction, is much in line with what you're talking about. I think... Initially, what I, I suspect will happen, the crawl mode is you'll just pick one, right? You'll go, hey, I'm going to do Einstein GPT or I'm going to do OpenAI on Azure or something, right? And that is kind of where a lot of our customers are. But to Anand's point, absolutely. As you move forward, you will have potentially more than one. So you may have a Bloomberg plus whatever, right? Or a healthcare-oriented AI. In the next 12 to 18 months, I am very certain we will see rise of extremely specialized AI models, which have been trained well, on billions of records. I mean, look at, look at what Salesforce is doing, right? Uh, I want to say like less than five years ago, they didn't really have industry clouds. Now they have what, 15, 16 of them. Every, every release, they have a new cloud coming up like sustainability cloud and net zero cloud. And very soon they're going to have like net zero cloud AI, financial services cloud AI. 
And they're going to say, hey, we're actually trained to answer financial services specific stuff like fintech or fins. Like, you know, there are terms, healthcare, for example, has the same thing, right? Manufacturing, you know, high tech. If you're in communications, you're going to like talk about a bunch of other things if you're in healthcare. So I think that's a trend. And then the one thing in, in the uh, a question from Saharsh actually um, prompted me to talk about this. So I, I, um, Salesforce talks about it. I think there's this whole ethical use of AI. I, Salesforce does it pretty decently well. Uh, there's a, a recognition of this, but I think the key phrase that I would use is co-pilot, not automation, uh, where there is this doom and gloom of AI taking over jobs. No, it's not going to take over people's jobs. Uh, yes, if you if you're doing that kind of a job of like literally scanning a document and extracting data out of it, if that is your day job for the entire day, perhaps AI is probably going to make that job a little redundant. But that probably is already redundant with digitalization. But the key phrase and term that I would use is copilot. Um, I think I am used like uh, Shopify, if, for those who know what that is, the one of the most leading B2C commerce uh, platforms, they actually launched Shopify Copilot. And I think Copilot is the right term. GitHub uses the word, word Git uh, Copilot. It is not making you a dumb developer, right? So that anyone can be a developer. It says we have a Copilot to make you a better developer. Everything that includes GPT-5 and other solutions, including Salesforce, are saying there is always going to be a human in the loop. So the co-pilot, and that's how we are thinking about this from an SDOCS perspective, is we are not eliminating the human, the humans in the loop, the humans in control, very much like Tesla's uh, self-driving cars or Cruise and Waymo's uh, self-driving taxis. Yes, it may look like there is no driver, but I am pretty darn sure that there is someone monitoring that car that can take over the car and put it to stop. It is always going to be assisted technology, not automated technology. Absolutely. I wanted to pull this slide from the security conversation we had. And uh, to your point, Anand, you're spot on. Particularly when you talk about bias and toxicity. And, and like I said, they're all recorded sessions. You can go and look at it. You absolutely want to do this. I think it needs to be a pretty important part of maybe even our decade, decade where we said, number one, you want to have a human in the loop because right. these technologies are still evolving. And even if they are highly evolved, we do not want to get to that, you know, RoboCop scenario, right? I kind of want to say that, like, it it, it really is a very heavy uh, obligation on all of us. It's a moral, ethical obligation to ensure that, you know, we, we, we want to have a human in the loop. I was in the health cloud, uh, you know, session that we had with Tina and Jake, and it was a brilliant session. And they brought this point up of first do no harm, which is a very health and life sciences Etho, and it should be a etho for all of us technologists as well, right? You want to make sure that uh, AI is not going to introduce this kind of toxicity or biasness. You want to make sure that it's not going to hallucinate, right? Those are those are legitimate challenges with some of these technologies, and uh, I would highly encourage you to uh, you know to kind of take a look at this session. But there is a lot of extremely good points that Anand you're making on this, and I. I really appreciate that, uh, you know, Sahersh or someone raised this. Um, all right, let me go back and see a little bit of our resources and then we can very quickly get to some Q&A. Uh, let's see, where are we at resources? So all of our, everything that we're talking about is available here. So please join this LinkedIn group and you will have access to pretty much everything. That's this one centralized place through which we are distributing it. So we don't have to email, message people and all that. All of the recorded videos, you know, all of these resources we are talking about are there. So definitely leverage this. Uh, this is the uh, PDF that we were just looking at, you know, the industry specific models and all. So this is uh, available from here as well. Uh, you can get a data sheet of our product if you are so inclined. You can check it out on App Exchange. And uh, this is some information about S Talks. I think it's already, already posted in our group as well. And like Anand said, you can reach out to him or you can look up as docs on App Exchange. They are also there and they are in Dreamforce. Um, really, that's it. Let's jump into some QA. Let me take a look if there are other questions we haven't answered here. 
uh carry predictions uh, i am still looking any comments anand you want to make while i'm kind of looking at any no i think yet? no i'm i'm i think one maybe request to the broader group that's listening or listening to this recording i think it would be great to kind of engage in that linkedin group around what are your thoughts how are you thinking about ai and roadmap and what what are your use cases right where do you think there is a build versus a buy? Uh, I think the the conversation shouldn't stop with this session. It should continue on in the LinkedIn group. So I'd be very, very curious about what, what folks are thinking about because uh, it's become this big AI thing. You know, Salesforce announced its results today. It's quarterly earnings. And, you know, as always, they kind of put a great marketing spin around this and said AI powered uh, Salesforce has beat earnings estimates. Einstein GPT has not been live for more than, you know, a couple of months, if not less. So, but I, I think there is a buzz and then there is reality. Uh, I'd like to kind of really engage with you all on what is the reality. I have my, my opinions and I'd love to hear more because sometimes those opinions change. Yeah. And I think uh, that's the part uh, I would say, the thing that, uh, you know, we were talking earlier about, uh, this is kind of how I think of it, right? These are the use cases. You can go look them up, right? These are PDFs. You can look them up. If you really strongly think this is uh, worth your time, then go spend that time, right? Kind of build their use, you know, those use cases for these kind of look at how can you do a follow-up email, for example, right? It's just a it's just a two-minute video. The thing that I like about what Anand is saying is, and particularly for AI, because we have seen this movie before with blockchain, with web 3.0, with a whole lot of new technology. Every new technology comes with so much hype. What you really want to do is you want to see how to move away from the hype and ground it in reality, reality of your challenges with data, reality of challenges that your organization would have in terms of security, compliance, ethics, reality of what is even possible with these technologies, right? Look, vendors are in the business of selling products and a lot of times selling uh, you know, a vision and they will do that. I'm a vendor, I, we do that, you know, I'm company is a vendor. They do that. They're all selling products. And we have possibilities that we have directions we are going in. And it is completely okay. But on the receiving end of it, when you are in an organization or you're a consultant helping your customer, you want to look at some of these and figure out what is real, what is meaningful for your uh, customer. And I hope that this entire deck gives you a sense of that, right? I would actually go back to that one slide, which was like, hey, these are the steps, right? So if you are a consultant, if you are an architect, if you are a, a VP or a CXO person, you know, in the room, and you're thinking about how do we do this, I think it's really very commonsensical. It's really some of these things, big, figuring this out, building a foundation, and just leveraging it to making it real. Uh, I'm going to take a look here. Uh, Anand, any comments on this? I'm going to take a look if there are other questions. Yep, okay. I think we covered a lot of this. All right. There's not too much questions, but again, I think we should uh, hope that the teams engage with us uh, and continue the conversation on LinkedIn. Absolutely. Absolutely. Please do that. Um, and I know this is, you know, we are kind of getting to the start of a long weekend. So we appreciate everybody's time in joining us. Uh, this has been a great conversation. And uh, like Anand said, would love to, you know, see you guys on, on our LinkedIn group. And uh, hopefully we all uh, get an opportunity to collaborate there. I'm going to just bring that group up for a minute here. If that's okay, let me just bring that up here. So this is the LinkedIn group that we were talking about. Uh, I think uh, our our you know folks have shared this. Uh, you know you can go in there. There's a lot of resources. There's a lot of recorded videos. There's a lot of other stuff that's here, and we will continue to add more. But please, please, please do share. Uh, you know your uh, your perspective, your recommendations you know, your challenges and things that we could have done better, things we missed in this conversation today. And just in general, how do we all solve this together? Because no matter what company you are in, what industry you are in, what whatever your role is, this is something that's coming for anybody who's associated with Salesforce. It's a fantastic opportunity for us to make an impact, to bring this transformative power to our organization. Uh, so that's pretty much it on my end, Anand. Any closing thoughts? Nope. I, thanks for the time. Um, thanks for taking the time to listen or be with us live. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, have a great weekend.